So what does it mean and how do, how do you become future-proof? I basically say like you have to be on top of every conversation and not just in your industry and not just in work but in other people's industries and also not just about you know what your career is all about, like whether you are a CMO of a company or a CEO of a company, COO of a company or whatever or, or a mid-level manager or, an entry, or having an entry-level position. Like you have to see how all the dots are connecting. You have to see what's happening in other industries because, you know, because of the forces that are changing both culture and business, they're affecting every industry. And the other thing I say is that you just don't have to be in the know of what's happening in business. But, you know, think about how these forces are affecting your personal life and also fe- affecting the things you love, your hobbies, your leisure. So um, it's impossible to be entirely future proof. But it's very possible to really know what's going on. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500 episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Brad, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. I'm honored to be here and really excited. It's you know it's funny. So I came across your story by way of our listeners, uh, one of our listeners who wrote in. And uh, after I started to do some research and dig, I thought, yeah, I am definitely interested. This guy sounds a lot like me, somebody who's incredibly curious and up to some really fascinating things in the world. So rather than give it away for our listeners, can you tell us uh, a bit about yourself, your your story, your journey, your background, and how that has led you to this rather unusual career that you've made for yourself? Okay, great. So um, basically, I have a company called Zeitguide, and our mission is to guide um, people through the Zeitgeist, our constantly changing culture. Zeitgeist, um, as many of you know, is a German word that means spirit of the times. And um, in a world where you know everything is changing so quickly and it's really hard to keep up and hard to stay future-proof, and it's challenging to not get disrupted, whether you're a, a legacy company or even a startup. Um, you know, our job, while everybody has real jobs, is to help them stay on top of the leading edge issues that are changing their businesses and therefore our world. Um, or actually there for our world and therefore everybody's businesses. And, um, you know, basically I'm an educator. You know, my job is to tell you what you need to know after my team and I go through every single piece of content, including this one, um, to, you know, find the diamonds in the rough and distill it and synthesize and make our content digestible so our clients who are very, very busy can know what they need to know. And um, you asked about my story. So Mm -hmm. being an educator basically started out right after I um, graduated from college. I was going to be a doctor. Um, and did really, really well in pre-med. I went to Brown, which is notorious for having a very liberal education. Um, it's perfect for somebody who's really curious um, because you could take any course and not have to take a core. And because I basically threw up on a patient one summer working at Mount Sinai, I decided that medicine isn't going to be for me. But growing up in, um, in, the, in suburbia in New Jersey, I – um, you know, didn't know what else to be. And this was in 1997 when I graduated college, you know, besides a doctor or a lawyer, because, you know, I, I watched, um, LA law and I watched, um, ER. So <laughs> <laughs> those are the only two things. So because I did so well in pre-med, especially organic chemistry, before I found my first real job, I decided to tutor high school kids in chemistry. And it was just, you know, the, I believe in the motto, like, you know, curiosity leads to serendipity. And I just had this love for teaching and I was able to break things down. Most of my students were high school girls, really, who were scared of science and chemistry. And, you know, I helped inspire them so that they could reach their fullest potential. And then, you know, I, out of the blue, three years later, I got a call from Brian Grazer. Um, I was living in LA and his office asked me to come in and meet with him. You know, I was a little perplexed by that because I'm like, you know, most people just have me meet them at their houses and, you know, ask me, you know, you know, what will it take to save their kid from, you know, or helping their kid get into the Ivy league school that they wanted to get into. Um, and, um, 
So I went into his office thinking that he was going to tell me more about his daughter, who actually was taking chemistry, and he basically said, you know what, I hear you're the tutor to the stars. I actually had some kids who I had to teach on set who were childhood actors, and he said, you know what, I don't want you to tutor my kids, I want you to tutor me. And I'm like, in what? He's like, in everything. I am just curious about the world. You know, you seem like a great teacher. It seems like you can digest anything, you know, from chemistry to calculus to the SATs. I'm a curious guy. I have this discipline of meeting with interesting people. And, you know, I would love one person to do that for me. And I got my ultimate dream job, as you said. Um, And, you know, after doing it for five years, I thought that, you know what, I could do it for other leaders and other industries. And you know, basically, you know, help them be on top of all the leading edge issues so they're creatively prolific and culturally relevant. So um, that's where Zeitgeist evolved into or okay. from. Well, so that raises a lot of questions you might imagine. Uh, you know, one of the things I'm always curious about is people's early uh, years, like childhood parents, mm-hmm. mentors, influences. I mean, you know, much like yourself, I was headed down this very linear oriented, uh, you know, achievement oriented trajectory. And of course, you know, when you're Indian, the only option in front of you is a doctor. They're like, eh, if you don't do this, <laughs> you you know, I won't go to my grave in peace. Is, is the, you know, those are the kinds of things you hear when, when you're an Indian kid. Uh, right. from, from, and I'm Jewish, by the way. So. What's that? And I'm Jewish. Okay, so, so probably similar. <laughs> um, so I, I'm curious, I mean, growing up like this, this, you know, curiosity about the world, was that just something that was always inherent in you? I mean, were there things when you look back at your early life that you could pinpoint and say, okay, it kind of all makes sense looking back like dots that you can connect now? Absolutely. Well, there were, th- I would say that there are three things that I remember about my childhood that's most relevant to your question is one, I would ask questions nonstop. I mean, a lot of curious people, you know, have that history like to the point where I would go to movies and I would just be asking my mother questions like every five minutes. Like, why did that happen? Why didn't he go left instead of right? Like I just was, you know, I had an insatiable curiosity in the sense that I just wanted to know. And, you know, my parents, you know, although very, very intelligent and they used to use the word street smart, they weren't as academically inclined as I became. But, you know, they basically were, have always been very charismatic and, you know, were very gregarious and, you know, would just talk to people everywhere. So I think I got that question asking sociability um, or let's call it social and emotional intelligence for my parents. Secondly, um, I just remember like when we would go to my mother's friend's houses, um, you know, because my mother was a... Um, a stay-at-home mom, and all the kids would go out and play, and I would just like sit at the at the at the kitchen table while they were having coffee um, and smoking cigarettes back in the seventies. <laughs> I just like sat there and listened, and just like you know whether they were gossiping or talking about like the the latest episode of Dallas. I just was like so interested in what they had to say, and I guess I was a little bit of a brown noser to the teachers too. Like I liked because I wasn't very good at sports, which is a whole other story of why I got to become. You know, I would just like kind of hang out with the teachers. So that is definitely you know, the second part. And then the third part, I would say that not many people are surprised when they hear about my story. I actually, because I didn't grow up in a very academically inclined um, family and upbringing, like I basically started out in the lowest reading group and the lowest math group um, in elementary school. And, you know, for me, that was, you know, I wasn't going to be able to tolerate that. So I did everything I had to do to be considered a great student. And to the fact that, like, you know, they wouldn't allow me into the honors classes in eighth grade because my test scores were really, really low. And I was so driven that I basically forced myself to memorize the dictionary. Not memorize, to actually really engage with it. I would have the dictionary and I would just open up to a random page. And if I didn't know the word, I would write it down on an index card. So I would say, and I would have a stack of index cards and then I took the test again. They allowed me to be in the honors classes, which led to my getting into Brown and blah, 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 blah. Um, So yeah, I mean, what's so interesting about all that is that it was a curiosity um, meets drive and to have the, to have the attitude that I could never fail. So, you know, that, that, I would say those three elements is what helped me get to where I am today. 
So a couple of questions come from that. Um, one is is about identity shifts, you know, and, and I've asked a handful of people this. You know, you said that you came from this situation and family where it, you know people weren't necessarily academically inclined, but then you get into Brown and you have the grades to get into med school, uh, mm-hmm. which I think is a pretty radical shift. And you talked uh, quite a bit about curiosity and drive. Uh, the yep. question for me is, is do you think that those are traits that can be developed and learned or you think they're inherent in certain people? Um, and if they can be learned, how do you think you cultivate those things? This is a very good question. Um, and you could probably write a book about it. <laughs> um, and actually, I'm, I'm trying to figure it out because my job is to figure out how my clients learn best. And, you know, and that enables me to create a curriculum and a learning style to make sure they need to know when they know what they need to know. But I think in terms like there's so many and as a tutor, I've seen so many different types of students as well. So I feel like people are definitely naturally gifted, um, but they're not naturally gifted in the very traditional way. Um, I had such a drive and I don't remember, I don't know how old you are, but I'm thinking that we might be similar in age. Close, yeah. I, yeah. I, I was born in 1975. I went to public school, grew up in New Jersey. And I remember that there was always a commercial on about like when there's a will, there's an A. And I definitely was a case study for that, um, for that theory or that hypothesis. I had a will to succeed in something. Um, I had a drive to succeed in something. And because I wasn't successful at sports and, you know, I grew up in a community where, you know, if you, if you were a boy, you were either good at sports or you were good at academics. Um, and then there were some who were good in theater, but, you know, I, I didn't, you know, get the opportunity to work in the, uh, get on that path. But, um, you know, I, you have to have a drive, I think, to succeed early on in your life. Now, later in life, I think it takes drive too. Um, but there are a lot of people, including my, you know, my former employer and boss, Brian Grazer, who, you know, he would say to me that we were complete opposites because, you know, he was, he would say that he was a straight F student, which of course I'm sure was exaggerated, but you know, he grew up as he's a self-proclaimed dyslexic and he's actually working with a lot of, you know, organizations who's helping to, you know, help kids with dyslexia. And he was, uh, you know, um, you know, I guess he had to face that, you know, that challenge growing up, but you know, He's successful. I consider my successful. I think myself successful. And, you know, whereas I was a straight A student, he was a straight F student, he would say, but he knew that he was special. And when he graduated from college and law school, he was able to, you know, learn the fact that his success or he could be successful by a combination of drive and curiosity. So, you know, I think that drive and the ability to become an autodidact, um, which basically I was, and obviously he was, is you know a, a reason for people's success. Which this is a whole other conversation. You know, I think that the educational system that we have today, or that I went through, basically stultify creativity and innovation, mm-hmm. um, and it takes a special type of person. And I feel like I was one of those people to basically say, "Okay, I got to do this, and I got to be disciplined." Mm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so interesting. That was going to be my next question is, you know, what is your perspective on the education system based on the the, the vantage point that you have, especially given the people that you've been exposed to and, and the work that you do? I mean, it must be really uh, interesting just to see. I, I'm very curious, you know, what your yeah. perspectives are on, you know, our modern education system, what's wrong with it, how we change it, uh, all those things. And I would say that my perspective on this issue um, is – you know, predicated by my experience working with kids. And from my experience, you know, because I was so driven, I was like, the when there's a will, there's an A kind of kid, also being very curious and also being able, I was socially intelligent and I was able to, you know, you know, work with the teachers to figure out how to succeed. In fact, I was, you know, anyway, whatever, I'll move on from that. But um, I, you know, I, you know, you know, I basically didn't even do it because like I, you know, there was a lot like calculus, for example, like I didn't really understand what calculus was until I went to Brown. All I cared about in high school was to get the A so I could get into Brown. However, 
you know, looking back on my education and seeing what my kids were, my, my, you know, the children that I was tutoring were going through is that they don't really understand why they have to know these kind of things. And that was my gift with these kids. It's like main, the, the main subject that I was teaching was, let's say, chemistry. Like the first thing that you have to do when you're taking chemistry is to like learn the, the periodic chart. Right. And and, you know, you know, do these. It was called stoichiometry, if you remember, like, you know, what a mole is and how, you know, you can tell, you know, how much of some substance you need to create a chemical reaction. And nobody cares about that unless you're like a chemistry um, aficionado, you know, and, and even, even if you were, you were probably more into the chemistry set that you got as a kid than actually, you know, taking an exam, balancing equations. So, you know, I think what really has to be done is to, you know, use a creative approach to help them or create a relevant approach to help them understand why chemistry matters. Like chemistry is the reason for everything. Chemistry is why two people fall in love, you know, for a lack of a better example, you know, chemistry is the reason why the sky is blue physics, you know, like the first thing I remember is that like force equals MA mass times acceleration. Like why don't they ask like the big questions of the world that all physicists are facing today? Like, you know, really what was the first you know, element or the first piece of matter that was ever created and how did our universe get created? Like they don't, it's more of like, they teach you to be more of an experimental scientist than a theoretical scientist. But like, I really think that you can't be an experimental unless you understand why you're, you know, why you need to perform these experiments. And how to apply it to different subjects too. Like I use the scientific method to test the hypotheses that I have about innovation and cultural change. It's like they don't teach the practicality. You know, it's really interesting you say that. So my, my business partner, Brian, uh, you know, he told me that if when he went to school, if people who are actually working on things related to the things that he was being taught uh, actually came to talk to him, he would have been far more interested in what was going on. But it just felt like he was consuming information that didn't serve any real purpose. Right. Instead of, you know, giving you a pop quiz – um, on, let's say, a chapter you were supposed to read to make sure that you didn't read the cliff notes, which I don't even know if, I don't think kids use that anymore, but we did, um, or I did, <laughs> um, to be completely frank. In fact, actually, people say that our Zeit Guide, you know, um, one, of, you know one of our clients, Beth Comstock, calls us the cliff notes, the culture, um, which is kind of funny. But, you know, but before now, now it's really helping you. Before it was more about cheating on the test. But, like, you know, how to relate it to your own experiences. So, you know, these two people fell in love and, you know, how to separate because of World War II. And, you know, have you heard that story before? You know, like talk to your parents, talk to your grandparents, talk to your friends. Like, you know, can you relate to the character in such a way? You know, it, it was more about like, you know, what happened before, um, you know, I don't know, what happened before Gatsby actually threw the party at 12.06 a.m.? Like, that's what I remember about my English classes. It wasn't really about, like, thinking about, like, what it means to you um, emotionally. Mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that, you know, I, I look back at my life, uh, you know, when, it, when I think about education and all the things that have happened and not how I've ended up here, is that forever all I did was choose from the options that were put in front of me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I always think like, I, 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 this is fresh on my mind because I was just speaking with a group of community college students today who are all freshmen. And, and one of the big messages I left them with is you don't have to choose from the options in front of you. But, you know, you go to school and you get a course catalog. Those are the options in front of you. Based on the course catalog, a certain set of careers open up, more options in front of you. I'm curious why you think it is that we have been conditioned to only choose from the options in front of us and how you start to break that conditioning. It's a good question. Um, and that also goes into a, a pretty interesting conversation of like, do, you know, young people who are graduating college really know what they should be when they grow up at this point? Like you were saying that you and I growing up in the type of family cultures that um, we're from, you know, suggested or thought that we should be doctors. And for me, it was either a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and so... I think that 
I think that it should be taught that these are suggested careers that you might want to choose, but there also has to be a way to illuminate the fact that our world is constantly changing right now and there's going to be a need for new types of jobs. So it's really important to learn a skill set than actual um, than the actual um, information that you need to have a specific job today. Um, but remembering like when I was graduating from college and the experience I just told you about, about, you know, learning that I shouldn't be a doctor, like I was petrified. I had no idea what I would be when I grew up. Um, especially since 50% of the choices I was choosing from, um, was not possible anymore. One being a doctor and I didn't want to go to law school. It sounded horrible to me and I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> so I, I think some people need guidance in terms of like what they possibly can be. Um, you know, but they also should be taught today that, you know, a career is so much different than it used to be. Um, and that to be successful in a particular career, you need to know how to be resilient and nimble and wear a bunch of different hats. So it's more about the skill set than the actual job that you need for the future. Hmm. So I would say skill sets are anything from having a visual eye, thinking creatively, um, understanding how to read data and finding patterns, how to code, how to engineer. Now, I don't think everybody has to do that, but that is... Like just because you know how to code and engineer, that doesn't mean you have to be a developer. In fact, you could be like Brian Chesky is a great example. I'm sure he understands technology, but he went to RISD. You know, so to be successful today, I think you have to understand the skill set um, and the psychologies behind what makes people who are successful tick today. Um, you know, like instead of Becoming a doctor, maybe you should say, you know what, I'm going to you know, know how to work with people. I, I'm really caring and I, I care about the world and I care about people's health. Um, but here are like 10 different types of careers that I possibly can choose from. And you know what? I might just do one of them or I might do all 10. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. I lost so. my, hold on. I lost my train of thought, which almost never happens. Um, uh oh, I stumped you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, I, I know where I wanted to go with this. Uh, so, you know, at the beginning of our conversation, you talked about this idea of becoming future proof, and that's what you guys, you know, help a lot of people do. Yep. I want to talk about that in more depth because I think it's such a relevant subject. It's something that I've thought about a lot, as you can imagine, as I talk to, you know, a, a different person every, you know, Monday and Wednesday and 600 conversations later, you know, I keep wondering, okay, what is it that makes somebody future proof? Because I certainly wasn't. And that's how I've ended up here. Um, because I wasn't future proof. I graduated April, 2009 from grad school and suddenly, you know, the world changed almost overnight. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, from the perspective that you have and the vantage point that you have, what is it that makes somebody future proof? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think there's two ways. One is to have knowledge and two, let's say three things, have knowledge, create systems and activate on an idea. But the most important element right now is because I personally think that nobody really does know the future. You know, in fact, there are so many people who actually coined me a futurist and I hate that term. It makes me feel uncomfortable because, 
you know, anybody who's telling you that they're a futurist is purely a bullshitter, you know, because nobody <laughs> really knows the future. I mean, nobody really knew that the internet was going to, you know, become what it is today and that we were going to, you know, there are, there were futurists who thought something, but like, if you think about, you know, 10 you know, 20, even 10 years ago, nobody really thought that we would be here today. Um, you know, maybe Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> but, you know, it's – so what I say is that, you know, I'm not the futurist. Everybody is a futurist. And my job as the Zeitguide and my company that are a bunch of Zeitguides, our job is to help you be best prepared for the future. So to kind of get you all up to speed so that you understand the future. And so what does it mean and how do, how do you become future-proof? I basically say like you have to be on top of every conversation and not just in your industry and not just in work but in other people's industries. And also not just about you know what your career is all about, like whether you are a CMO of a company or a CEO of a company, COO of a company or whatever, or, or a mid-level manager or an entry or having an entry level position. Like you have to see how all the dots are connecting. You have to see what's happening in other industries because, you know, because of the forces that are changing both culture and business, they're affecting every industry. And the other thing I say is that you just don't have to be in the know of what's happening in business. But, you know, think about how these forces are affecting your personal life and also affecting the things you love, your hobbies, your leisure. So um, it's impossible to be entirely future proof, but it's very possible to really know what's going on. And right now it's problematic for everybody to have that because they don't have the time to listen to the great podcast that you're doing Monday and Wednesday. Of course, you have an audience, right? But, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that, like, they have time for you. And, like, we're, we're in a, a moment right now of what people are calling the content bubble, Right. So, you know, people are, you know, they're anxious because they're feeling like they're missing out on so many things. So, you know, obviously one way to be future proof is to hire us, but I'm not going to pitch. But there are systems that every organization can create to create an informational and a cultural community so that everybody's on the same page and you're engaging everybody in the organization, not just having ideas that are going from the top down. And, you know, we, we advise companies in many different forms based on the cultures of their companies on how to do that. So the best way to be future proof is obviously to, to know what's happening and also not to be so anxious about what's going to happen. You, know, you talk about the idea of knowledge systems and activating ideas and then, you know, kind of what you guys do. And I'm curious if you could give us a framework that people could apply personally to incorporate knowledge systems and ideas into their life to be aware of what, what it is they need to be aware of. And also, I mean, how does this work in terms of your own process uh, at Zeitguide to sort of parse the signal from the noise? Great. Okay. So all day long, um, like I said, everybody has their real jobs. Um, my team, we call fine filter focus. Um, so it's about finding everything on a particular Subject. So we basically have five leading edge issues that we're always focusing on. We're talking about big picture hotbed ideas. That's digital transformation, which is obvious. Globalization or global growth and its challenges, obvious, you know, because our because our world is becoming flat or has become flat, as Thomas Friedman coined, like almost a decade ago. You know, now our world, you know, our world is becoming more um, connected to you know, other places in the world and businesses are moving into other markets, et cetera. So those are two. The third one um, is basically consumer and pop culture. Now, when we talk about consumer culture, we're not just talking about millennials and now Gen Zs. I think MTV called them the, the founder generation. Um, we're not just talking about that. We're talking about like how is, you know, what's happening with the aging Chinese demographic or what does it mean that the Chinese can have one more child than ever before? You know, it's, 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 it's a global consumer, um, intelligence, um, workplace health and leadership is like another big, you know, issue that we're always, um, focusing on. And the last one is creativity. 
you know, you know, what is creativity? How do you become more creative? And what are examples and best practices of creative work that is resonating with our world and, and you know, and, and, and human beings? So those are like five leading edge issues that we're always covering and we're, we're basically analyzing them for how they relate to our particular clients and particular industries. Um, and so I have, a, you know, a, 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 a an overseer, a researcher who's basically taking that subject and every day long, every day they're basically reading everything or looking at everything we call fine filter focus, first curating the, the pieces that you think are most relevant, then, you know, basically filtering and distilling it into takeaways. And, you know, I always say, like, let's go back to elementary school, like who, what, where, when, why, how, why is this piece important? What does it tell you? What is it telling you that nothing else and nobody else is telling you, you know, who are the leaders, you know, that are creating, you know, who are saying great quotes or insights, what are good examples that support the takeaway of the article, and most importantly, how does this piece continue the, the narrative of that particular cultural change? So if, let's say, we're talking about collaboration and people, you know, are saying everybody has to be collaborative right now because you have to engage everybody and blah, 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 then the Harvard Business Review has a cover story last week about how the, the methodology and the theory and the practice of collaboration is causing more, you know, workers to burn out. So, like, that is a very interesting, relevant piece of information that is talking about collaboration, which is under the bucket of workplace health and leadership. Um, so, and so then, you know, I have that executive, you know, read the article, distill it into its bite-sized chunks, and then our client who's interested in leadership and, and workplace health, we're going to basically tell them that. So that's the fine, that's the filter and then the focus is where you know we have a vast connection of experts from all different industries and because they're fans of the Zeit guide you know they're giving us really specific um, insights and context so that um, you know we can make sure that our information and our um, our content is very authentic and, and exclusive in the sense that we have exclusive insights that no one else is providing. So that's what we call fine filter focus. And then we deliver um, digestible, you know, our clients say engaging content, whether it's in a newsletter form, whether it's in a video, whether it's in a distilled report that kind of shows you, you know, the big picture. One report we did for a client on um, what makes great customer service today and why it's important you know, within a month, we distilled 50 white papers and 87 articles. And the Zeitgeist, which is our consumer product, that actually has 650 links that we curated throughout the year. But if you really want to go deep, you could go to those 650 links. But if you don't, you could just read the 120 page, you know, short little digestible digest. Um, and you know, we, we're telling you what we need to know. So that's our process. So basically it's fine filter focus and then we deliver the content, whether it's in written form, whether it's design, whether it's video so that you can know everything you need to know on that subject and give you the primers so that you can keep track of the cultural change. Well, let's just, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your time working with Brian Grazer because I'm always curious about what people learn when they work with sort of, you know, cultural visionaries and people who, you know, for all intents and purposes are, are people that are household names and have done really sort of iconic things with their career. I mean, for anybody listening, if you don't know the name Brian Grazer, maybe you know the TV show Friday Night Lights or 24 or any of those things. Um, so I, I'm curious, what did you learn about life, success, um, business and everything else from you know, working with somebody like Brian? Well, I have to give him the credit for, you know, what he says in, the, in his book. Like, you know, I always thought that being curious was an annoying trait. <laughs> and now I'm understanding that my curiosity is basically the foundation for, for success. Um, so I have to you know, thank him and give him the credit for teaching me to embrace my curiosity. Another thing was creativity. I mean, I was actually, I felt like the worst person in art class. I dreaded it. Um, because again, as I told you that I grew up in a culture that, you know, um, 
you know, uh, measured success by being a good doctor or a lawyer. And, you know, if you're creative, you're either a creative writer or you're, you know, you're great at art, you know. And I understood from him, from meeting the 300 people that I brought in for us to meet in that job I had, that creativity isn't just about what you think it is in terms of being like a director or a writer or a fiction writer or blah, blah, blah. Um, it's about thinking and your approach to life and, you know, disrupting yourself in terms of ideas. Um, so now I'm learning that, you know, you know, creativity is definitely one of my most um, loved attributes about myself. Um, so that, that was the second, you know, most important um, lesson that I learned from, from Brian. And then I guess the third part is really, you know, anxiety is good. You know, um, that, you know, usually you're going to come up with your best work if you're feeling a bit of um, uneasiness and instead of freaking out about the anxiety and that negative, well, you might think a negative emotion, you should use it to your advantage. You should use it as a sign um, as that you're onto something really, really great. And that led to my own self-realization. We talked about this, I think, before we started the, the podcast, that patience is such a virtue. Um, you know, you and I both, you know, I think we're, we have the commonality that we both started our, you know, the, our most prized projects seven years ago. And, you know, in a culture now where, you know, people are, you know, you know, you know, want to be the hottest startup, and you're reading every day that they're raising fifty million dollars and they're worth. Now they're becoming unicorns, and blah blah blah, and everything's fast, fast, fast. How do you scale? How do you grow? I mean, every single person in the last five years ad nauseum has been asking me that, like, you know, how do you scale? How do you grow? And the answer I would say is that you know it happens naturally. You know, you can't force it because if you force something, you're going to lose your authenticity and your 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 initial vision. There's obviously a lot other, and there's so many things that, yeah. you, know, you know, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Um, you know, it's, yeah, so, I don't know. I could, I could think about it a little bit more as we, you know, move forward, but I would say those are the, the main points. Do you think that um, the thing that enables the kinds of achievements uh, – you know, that you've kind of been exposed to through people like Brian, through pe the people that he's brought in for these curiosity conversations. Yep. Do you think everybody is capable of those or everybody has that like X factor that enables that? Enables what success? Well, you know, those kinds of accomplishments at that sort of, you know, level that we look up to as, okay, this is the gold standard. Okay. Well, first of all, I would love to see how you define what a gold standard is. That's a, that's a fair question. Um, I guess, you know, success in which, you know, your, your work has basically uh, enabled you to make an incredibly uh, lucrative living is one. Not that, you know, money is the end all and be all of success by any means. But, um, I mean, you know, to create work that reaches millions of people and to create work that has the kind of impact on culture that people like you and people like Brian have had. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You need to know what people want. Mm -hmm. I remember Brian would, would tell me about um, that his success was predicated on the fact that he knew what his actors wanted before they even asked. Um, you, have to, you have to know what people want. And getting back to your question about being future-proof, um, you know, if you're stuck in a tunnel, right, and you're, you know, you're tone deaf, to the conversations that's happening in the world, then you're definitely going to fail. Um, and, you know, you have to, you have to, first of all, you have to believe in an idea so much that you're going to be relentless um, in terms of making it happen. But then you also have to understand what the audience, who's the audience first, and you have to understand what they want. And naturally and serendipitously, um, that drive that you have or the idea that you have is going to resonate with the zeitgeist. Hmm. 
So yeah, I would say most people who are successful have an idea, they're passionate about the idea, they're going to do anything in their power to make sure that that, that idea happens. But they also have to understand who their audience is, whether it's investors or consumers, right? You have to understand how they're thinking and they're, and they're feeling so that, you know, the way that your work will work, no matter how much work you put into it, how much energy you put into it, you have to understand that it resonates emotionally to what people are wanting or expecting. And back to what I said before, even though they don't know what they want. In your own work, um, do you ever have any moments uh, throughout the journey when you wanted to quit or you felt like it wasn't working out or, you know, just beyond stressed out about something? Oh, my God. I can't even count the number of times. It's, uh, it's, it's excruciatingly painful to be, um, first of all, an entrepreneur, um, you know, creating something from nothing. Um, sometimes the idea is kind of like the easy part, but then actualizing on that idea and making it happen is the hard part. Um, you know, I, th- there's so many elements and I think you realize what you're best at. Um, most entrepreneurs I would say, and the ones that I've met are the ones that have the idea and the drive and the vision to make something happen. But you also have to know who the right people you should have in your organization so that, you know, your vision remains authentic to what you felt originally. And, um, and, you know, just know that you can't do everything and then you have to let go and make sure that you have the right people around you to do the stuff that you're not necessarily good at. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so many times it's, it's, it's painful. I mean, I, I actually did a zeitgeist on the psychological price of the entrepreneur. Um, big conversation that's bubbling up. I mean, I think, well, I mean, I don't know what the stats are now, but like four out of five, um, startups fail, which is a lot of pressure. Um, you know, there's big talk right now about the, the bubble and like the, the loose definition of what makes a unicorn. Um, obviously funding is drying up because of a, the economy and B, um, interest rates are rising. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure on the entrepreneur. In fact, I read a piece that 49% of entrepreneurs are considered mentally ill. (laughs) So, um, but you know, that's, that's a loose term. I mean, you know, mental, mental illness could be comprised of yes, depression and, and, you know, issues that are more severe, you know, um, problems that are more severe. Um, but it also could be, you know, ADD or, or insomnia or, um, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So yes. Um, sometimes I, I've been in, in, in points of my growth here where I'm just like, wouldn't it be easier to just have a job, get the paycheck, um, get the big paycheck, um, you know, being a system where, you know, there's an infrastructure in place and there's a routine and, you know, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about growth. It just comes to you. But then at the other, then I think about it, it's like, I love what I do and I love having, you know, uh, I, I mean, it's a blessing and a curse. I've always been so excited about charting a path that nobody's ever taken before. And that's another reason why it's been so stressful. I mean, I created a company that's definitely relevant now and was specifically relevant to a movie producer, you know, but, you know, if the world hasn't disrupted, it's, uh, you know, if the world hasn't changed, whether it's the financial collapse that contributed to it or digital technology and startups that have been disrupting legacy organizations, you know, I'm not so sure that I would have a successful business today. Hmm. So... Yeah, I mean, I, I think about it a lot, but you know, thankfully, things are finally moving smoothly, and you know, and the hard work and the fact that I, it's it's my company, you know, feels great, and the fact that I'm helping people, you know, that's 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 what keeps me going every day. Wow, um, well, this has been really interesting. A uh, little different than a lot of the conversations we had, but um, I just get, you know, I was so fascinated by what you do and, and, you know, why you do it. So I have one last question for you, which is how we finish all our interviews. Uh, okay. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Uh, 
authenticity. I know people throw around that word a lot, but you know, I you have to have an emotional belief system that you know that things are going to be okay, um, and that you're doing everything you're doing to succeed and have a great life, and you know. And you have to be curious and you have to put yourselves in uncomfortable situations and disrupt your comfort zone and, and read a lot and see a lot and open up your mind. And then, you know, serendipitously, you know, you're, you're just going to fall into something that is just going to make sense. And you won't realize that until you look back. I mean, you have that famous Steve Jobs speech where, you know, he's just – talking about how he went from, you know, nothing to somebody's garage to being the most um, successful and prolific visionary of our cultural history. And you know, he said that the only way you could really understand it is by connecting the dots going backwards. So in terms of moving forward, you know, all the things are – are going to happen are unmistakable if you have a core belief system that's authentic. Well, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us and uh, share your story and your insights with our listeners. This has been really cool. Well, thank you so much. I'm a huge fan and, um, you know, I, I love what you do. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that next time on The Unmistakable Creative. This guy who we were working with, he was one of our clients, decided to import some of these ideas to his house and with his family. Um, so one of the things we often advocate, uh, advocate is the power of gratitude, saying three new and unique things you're grateful for each day for a period of 21 days. We recommend 21 days because it's a nice way to jumpstart a positive habit in our lives. By day 28 and 29, neuroscientists are able actually to see on a brain scan new neural pathways being formed and new parts of the brain lighting up, which is unbelievable. So this guy said, well, I love saying my gratitudes myself and writing them down, but what if we were to say it around the dinner table, which I know is a habit many parents have. It ended up having an unintended consequence, with, especially with his teenage daughter. So his five-year-old kind of was like, oh, dad, this is fun and cute. The teenage daughter, not really into it. The wife, of course, supported this behavior and they all start saying their gratitudes um, cut to like two or three weeks later. And the dad gets a call from one of the girl, the, his teenage daughter's girlfriend's fathers, the other dads. And the other dad says, uh, your daughter was at my house for a sleepover this past weekend. And we have to talk. He's like, Oh no, what did my daughter do this time? What his daughter had ended up doing was because she felt that the girls at school were being mean and she was now well-versed in this practice of speaking up about positive good things that people are doing or good things going on in her life, she decided to get all the girls to sit down in a circle at the sleepover and go around the circle and say nice things about one another. Happiness researcher and author Michelle Galen joins us to talk about how to broadcast happiness.